Hello, my name is Philippe Kempenex, and I'm a psychologist and sex therapist. I also live in Belgium, which explains my terrible French accent. Sorry for that. On a more serious note, I've worked a lot with men who have problems with rapid ejaculation. Men who are sometimes in great distress and who are unfortunately confronted with inaccurate perceptions, even from professionals, about how to overcome their difficulty. This is why I believe it's essential to provide some information. Obviously, this video doesn't claim to solve a problem of this type that you may encounter, but I hope that it will help you to understand the basis of an effective treatment at least in the current state of scientific knowledge, and I hope that it will allow you, if necessary, to orient yourself towards relevant solutions. Let's now characterize the PE. Everyone agrees that premature ejaculation, let's call it PE, is a difficulty that meets three criteria. It's an ejaculation that occurs rapidly, over which the man has little sense of control, and this situation leads to a feeling of distress. This widely accepted definition is the one found in the 11th edition of the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD-11, published by the World Health Organization. Viewed in this way, PE appears to be highly prevalent. It's thought to affect at least 20% of the male population. It's also common to distinguish between several forms of the difficulty. Lifelong forms are often contrasted with acquired forms, and a distinction is also made between generalized and situational forms, depending on whether the difficulty occurs every time or only in certain circumstances. The forms of PE can be further distinguished according to a chronometric criterion. Several forms of PE would be characterized by ejaculations occurring systematically less than two to three minutes after intromission whereas uh, the so-called variable or subjective forms of PE would concern ejaculation that are considered to be rapid, but which occur, at least occasionally, behind three minutes of penetration. This is the option defended by the International Society for Sexual Medicine and by the American Psychiatric Association in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the famous DSM-5. It's a fact, however, that there is no consensus among experts on what would be an adequate way to distinguish between different clinical forms of PE or even whether this is necessary. The issue at hand is to try to identify forms of PE that would correspond to particular etiologies and would be likely to respond to differentiated interventions. However, it should be noted that in the current state of knowledge, there is no clear evidence to support the hypothesis of a correspondence between specific forms of PE, specific causes, and specific corresponding treatments. In fact, the causes of PE are still unclear. A series of risk factors have been identified, like serotonin hypofunction, penile hypersensitivity, emotionality, etc., but their individual incidence remains extremely discreet. In the end, PE appears as the result of a complex tangle of, a, of various processes, both biological and psychosocial, and clinically, the most useful way of thinking about the difficulty is as a biological con condition that can be modulated either chemically or behaviorally.
In the end, the choice of strategy, pharmacological or psychobehavioral, is primarily a matter of preferences, those of the patient and those of the clinician who may be familiar with one approach rather than the other. Well, having said the global scene, let's now try to understand the dynamics of the problem. Let's look first at the question of penetration times. In a remarkable survey, Waldinger and his colleagues questioned men in different parts of the world about the duration of their coitus. They introduced the concept of intravaginal ejaculatory latency time, the IOT, which simply consists of timing the time separating the intromission of the penis into the vagina from ejaculation. They concluded that the median duration time was around five minutes and a half. In other words, 50% of coitus lasted less than five minutes and 50% more than five minutes and a half. But what is interesting to observe is that people's aspirations are generally behind the median five minutes. Indeed, Many studies indicate that there is a consistent gap between what people actually achieve in terms of penetration times and what they look like, they would like, sorry. To illustrate this, I have chosen one particular eloquent study, but there are several others that point in the same direction. Cotelier and Rowland found that when people were asked to time their coitus, they produced a median value of five minutes, exactly like in Waldinger's earlier study. But when asked what they thought was an ideal duration, they gave higher values around 10 minutes. We could thus represent the situation as follows. Here is a curve that describes the deployment of sexual arousal over time. The physiological indices that characterize arousal intensify during stimulation. They stabilize for a period of time in a so-called plateau phase here. And then they rise sharply during orgasm only to fall back to the baseline. Let's consider that intromission occurs at this point. Under median conditions, the time between intromission and ejaculation is between 5 and 6 minutes. A first view would be to represent PE as a shortened curve, allowing the man only 1 or 2 minutes of penetration, for example. This view of the problem is not wrong, but it seems somewhat limited as it ignores the fact that most coitus appears to be shorter than what most people aspire to. From this point of view, whether coitus lasts one or five minutes doesn't fundamentally change the case. Even biological normal penetration times are still generally below what is desired. So, PE is probably less about the length of penetration than about a lack of control over the arousal process. A control that would allow the natural course of the process to be modulated in the direction of desire. Ultimately, most men must learn to modulate their arousal in the direction of their desires. Many succeed spontaneously, others do not, those who complain about PE. The therapeutic intention is therefore to help them to achieve 
such learnings. But why do so many men have aspirations that go so far beyond what seems to be the biological norms? One of the most common answers is based on what they believe, rightly or wrongly, to be the wishes of their partners. Let's see that. Uh, it seems that on average, the duration of tactile stimulation required to obtain an orgasm is longer for women that, than for men. Estimates put the duration of stimulation at around 5 to 8 minutes for men, whereas for women, obtaining an orgasm would regularly require more than 8 minutes of tactile stimulation. So, there is quite a discrepancy in terms of tactile stimulation required for orgasm, men are inherently faster than women. So, if coitus is the only tactile stimulation modality, many women are likely to be left wanting. Men is therefore rather fast. In this respect, it is probably not much different from other mammals. In many species, coitus appears to be rapid. For example, it doesn't exceed 15 seconds in rodents, 30 seconds in cats, lions, or even elephants, and gorillas do barely better with 3 minutes. By way of comparison, we would say that out out fast, humans do not so badly with their 5 minutes of copulation. In nature, the speed of the male probably has an adaptive advantage. The faster the male goes, the more likely he is to spread his genes. But what is an advantage from the point of view of perpetuating the male's genes is not necessarily an advantage from the point of view of the female's pleasure. And is the female's orgasm essential for the reproduction of the species? Certainly not as much as that of the male. No doubt, Mrs. Rabbit, Mrs. Squirrel, or Mrs. Elephant must be somewhat receptive to mating. No doubt they must find some pleasure in it, but from there to think that their orgasm is necessary, nothing is less sure. However, with the advent of language and culture, men have integrated the fact that their female partners can also have a lot of pleasure and even orgasms. And they often include the pleasure of their female partners among the aims of sexuality. But man is still a member like any other, and with five to eight minutes of coitus as the only tactile stimulation, he can hardly claim to bring his girlfriends to heaven. If he wants to increase the pleasure of his partner, he will have to free himself from a natural copulation pattern. He will have to cheat nature in a certain way. There are different ways of cheating nature. They can be grouped into three main strategies. The first is to relativize the penetration of the vagina by the penis as a means of giving and receiving pleasure. This will involve developing a range of alternative behaviors. A second way of cheating nature consists of learning to manage one's sexual arousal without giving in directly to a series of sensory motor automatisms which, by reinforcing each other, will thus precipitate the ejaculatory reflex. We can say that these first two ways of cheating nature correspond to the two main axes of the psychosocial treatments of PE.
And there's also a third way of cheating nature, but we won't go into this today as it's a pharmacological strategy which is marginal to our discussion. It consists of using drugs like dapoxetine or paroxetine or local gels like lidocaine, which interfere with the arousal process and thus delay the onset of the ejaculatory reflex. The two first ways of cheating nature constitute the two main axes of sex behavioral treatments, those on which we will now focus. Sex therapists generally propose a psychobehavioral treatment structured in two main areas. Firstly, it's a question of relativizing the coital norm. The therapist has to question the possible presence in, in patients' heads and in those of their partners of inappropriate representations of sexual exchanges of possible scripts that are not in phase with the exercise of a pleasure that lasts. This is the case with representations of eroticisms that are excessively focused on coitus, for example, or with representations of coitus that require rapid, vigorous and continuous movements. It's a question of trying to deconstruct these kinds of inappropriate representations and to get people to experiment with alternative caresses. This first line of treatment is therefore largely marked by psychoeducation and by sensory experiments, like the famous so-called sensate focus exercises, which are found in the treatment of many sexual dysfunctions. The second axis is much more specific to PE problems. It aims to counteract a naturally rapid orgasmic rise with the help of exercises specifically dedicated. We will discuss them later. To understand the objective of this second axis of intervention requires keeping in mind that ejaculation is a purely reflex phenomenon. As such, it's impossible to exercise voluntarily control over it. Ejaculation occurs automatically automatically from a certain degree of arousal. But if it's not possible to voluntarily control one's ejaculatory reflex, it's possible to voluntarily control what comes before and provokes it, namely the arousal process. This requires to understand what this process consists of. The arousal mechanism can actually be broken down into several discrete reactions which reinforce each other. The idea is to identify them in order to try to act individually on each of them. Let's now look at the discrete reactions that define the arousal process. First, Arousal is characterized by genital sensations that are coded as pleasurable. Through the play of so-called reward circuits, the man spontaneously seeks to increase his sensations by maintaining and increasing contact, visual or tactile contact, with the effective stimuli. He must say to himself something like, more and again. And in terms of motor mechanics, this translates into an initiation and intensification of copulatory movements, which in turn leads to an increase of pleasurable feelings. And with the increase of pleasant sensations, 
there is also a cognitive focus of attention on the triggering stimuli. In the male's mental space, nothing or almost nothing exists but his pleasurable penile sensations and the partner's enticing forms and gesticulations. This is a form of selective attention that further increases the influx of pleasurable sensations. It's a real mental funnel. The process is accompanied by a significant activation of the sympathetic nervous system. For short, it is composed of adrenaline nerves. And this uh, specific part of our nervous system facilitates each of the reactions involved in the arousal process and it is also directly responsible for triggering the sperm emission reflex. The ejaculation is thus the end point of a loop circuit which feeds itself in an exponential mode. What one could compare this operation to that of an electrical short circuit. The current produced by the system is re-injected into the system so that the energy increases exponentially and the ejaculation is the fuse that blows. Oops. Given such a process, the man in copulation can hardly expect to last more than a few minutes of tactile stimulation without ejaculating. The increase in excitement is rapid, and assuming that intromission occurs at such time, for example, if nothing is done to modulate the course of the arousal, ejaculation is likely to occur within three to four minutes of penetration. Therapists can therefore propose a series of behavioral exercises aimed at moderating the expression of the various components of the reflex chain. This in order to slow down the rise in arousal and thus to increase the duration of pleasure. Like this. These exercises first take place in the context of masturbation. Masturbation represents for men a kind of laboratory, a kind of exercise ground. For example, therapists can suggest that the man adopt an original masturbatory mode, the fixed worst moving body mode, which is the exact opposite of the usual masturbatory mode, namely the fixed body moving worst mode, that most people tend to adopt spontaneously. Such a masturbatory fixed worst moving body automatically induces a slowing down of the copulatory rhythm. But not only does the fixed worst mobile body mode tend to slow down the copulatory movement, but it also mobilizes a whole series of body and muscle segments, like legs or back, segments that are not usually involved in natural copulation, which is centered on the pelvis. In a way, this exercise is promoting a diffusion of sensory motor tension over the whole body instead of a concentration in the genital area alone. In addition, the therapist can also propose relaxation exercises, in particular, in particular slow and calming breathing exercises which are relatively easy to apply. Exercises such as abdominal breathing or cardiac coherence can induce a moderation of sympathetic activation. They can induce a reduction in hyperventilation and a relative deceleration of the heart, which is the opposite of what is observed in the natural process of excitation. The man's attention 
To his breathing, rhythm can furthermore produce an attentional disimpression from the genital area to include the whole body. It's also possible to propose meditative exercises that will increase attention to the multiple elementary reactions involved in the excitatory process and thus facilitate its modulation. In the end, the excitatory rise will be greatly slowed down, like this. Another type of exercise consists of posing the stimulation of the penis. This method is called the stop-start. It's probably the best now. In this exercise, the man masturbates or is masturbated, and then he poses when he feels he has reached a high level of arousal close to ejaculation. This is a stop phase. At this point, the man lets his arousal go down again, he rock focuses on his whole body, he also play, pays attention to his breathing and slows down the rhythm. And when his arousal has reached a certain level of moderation, he resumes the stimulation of the penis. This is a start phase. He continues in this way until he has again reached a high level of excitement and then he pauses again. It's a stop phase. And then he starts again and so on several times before allowing himself to ejaculate. In the long run, the stop and start phases can be replaced by simple variations in rhythm. In total, this will produce an arousal curve made up of variations in tension. In addition to the slowing down of the arousal supply, there are breaks in the rhythm which also act as modulation instrument. And when the man has reached a certain mastery of these exercises under masturbation condition, the therapist will suggest that he transposes his emerging skills into coitus situations with his partner. The idea is to move from a cold training situation to a hot relational situation. This is sometimes a bit tricky, you know. And the clinician has to reassure the person, he has to supervise him and give him advice and adaptations in order to facilitate the transition from the laboratory to the field. The recommendation for such an approach is supported by a systematic review of the literature. Now, let's take a quick look at what the effectiveness studies say. There are currently 32 trials of psychobehavioral treatments for PE, spanning several decades and including pre- and post-treatment assessments. Overall, these treatments are effective, with improvement rates ranging from 25 to 100%, and effect sizes ranging from 0 0.80 to 3.57, that are medium to very large effects. So, sex behavior strategies are effective overall. But they are also variably effective, and the variations in effectiveness depend on the methodologies and techniques deployed. A detailed examination of the variation in results therefore makes it possible to specify the conditions for the effectiveness of these strategies. I have now to insist on two basic conditions. First of all, there are conditions that appear absolutely essential. It's essential 
that the treatments involve penile stimulation techniques. And there are two major approaches here. The first is based on penile stimulation techniques interspersed with poses. It's the so-called stop-start method, which has been used by many sex therapists. It aims to help men to become habituated and desensitized to his arousal sensations. And the other approach consists in body exercises aiming at modulating the discrete components, motor, attentional, respiratory, of the excitation. This method can be qualified as regulating. Some treatments focus more on stop-start exercises, other on regulation exercises, but whatever the precise combination, what is essential is that these exercises allow the man to learn concretely how to manage his arousal. Behavior experimentation forms the core of therapeutic efficiency. To do without it doesn't seem possible. The LH, the LH therapeutic mechanisms are habituation and desensitization of penile sensations and the learning of skills to regulate the arousal process. Second, it also seems important that patients have access to professional supervision. This supervision is likely to promote a good understanding of the mode of action of the treatment. Supervision is also what will enable the person to question the scripts that may be unsuitable and that may contribute to his sexual distress. It is an opportunity for psychoeducation that focuses on the person's general relationship with sexuality. If necessary, it will be a question of making him more flexible, of experimenting with alternative or complementary caresses to coitus. In short, this framework allows to clean up the context. Supervision is also what allows the protocol to be adapted to the particular situations that the person may encounter. The supervision by a professional as a facilitating virtue, and this is probably what makes treatment formulas in individual or even group sessions more effective than more impersonal treatment formulas such as bibliotherapy or web-based application. However, these later options shouldn't be neglected when treatment in a more traditional format is not possible. Without being the central elements, certain bodily and cognitive techniques can certainly facilitate the treatment, such as relaxation or mindfulness techniques, or even yoga techniques, which, without being sufficient in themselves to achieve the goal, facilitate the regulation of the elementary components of the excitations. On the other hand, it seems unnecessary to use penile compression techniques in support of posing exercises, or to use a vibrator, or to favor stimulation at the root of the penis rather than at any other point. However, there is here one nuance. Also, these techniques cannot be statistically demonstrated to be effective, some of them may still be useful in certain particular cases, but these conditions remain to be specified. Finally, some techniques appear ineffective. This is the case, for example, with exercises aimed specifically at strengthening the pelvic muscles 
and with relaxation techniques used alone or with treatment programs that are exclusively verbal without behavioral exercises. In summary, the effectiveness of sex therapies lies in a few key points. First of all, the erotic context must be cleaned up, and it must be made clear that the duration of coitus is not as important as the pleasure experienced, and that there are probably other ways of getting pleasure than increasing the duration of coitus. Doesn't the complaint of rapid ejaculation mask an under-exploitation of these other ways? Mm -hmm. This is the essential question posed by the first axis of the treatment. The next step is to propose a series of behavioral exercises specifically designed to promote adequate self-regulation of sexual arousal and a process of habituation desensitization to the sensations of arousal. There are several types of exercises that can achieve this, like stop-start, slow masturbation, abdominal breathing, etc. But what is important here is to understand their usefulness. Professional guidance is therefore often welcome to avoid their misuse and to adapt them to the specific situation of couples and to avoid incongruous approaches such as pelvic, pelvic strengthening. This is the second axis of treatment. Finally, it's also useful to play down the possible use of pharmacological treatment. This third way of cheating nature, which can prove to be a very useful complement to the first. Well, I've now come to the end of my presentation. I hope that my remarks have helped to see the problem more clearly. And the most curious among you will find more information in the following bibliography. Here it is. And it remains now for me to thank you for your attention and to wish you a beautiful life with a fulfilling sexuality. Bye.